Hello and welcome to another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Reis, your host. And our guest today um, has a fascinating uh, book that's written on, on St. John Paul II, How He Changed the World. Before we introduce him, he is the founder of Nova Media, and you can check that out, uh, novamedia.com. And also, uh, he is, it's, his name is Patrick. And let me get this, uh, Novikoski, the pronunciation, Patrick Novikoski. Uh, and you can visit his website at booksbypatrick.com. Uh, uh, fascinating, man, getting to know him more and more. And uh, we're going to get to know him a bit today. So let's welcome him now. Hello, Patrick. How are you doing? Hey, my friend. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, congratulations on the book. It was recently launched late last year. Um, yeah. How, how's it been going in these, in these last few months? Well, the book was supposed to be out in April in time for John Paul's 100th birthday in May, but because of COVID, the publisher had to delay it until October. So it was released October 1st in hard copy. It's been out in, uh, in e as an ebook since the spring. It's done very well. It's done very well. I've got some very positive reviews. Uh, very a lot of I, I think the best compliment I got was from my the, the gentleman who wrote my foreword who Paul Kingor he wrote a Pope and a President he wrote two books about Reagan and John Paul II and he said that essentially this I've written two books about this Pope I've given hundreds of lectures and there are things in Patrick's book that I didn't know. <laughs> so if I'm stumping the experts, I think I'm, 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 I'm very proud of that and, and really grateful to God for the opportunity to write this book. Yeah, praise God. Yeah, well, well done on that. And uh, I can't wait to get my hands on it. And uh, we want to really make it available uh, to this whole region through Parisia one day. But we're going to work on that. But uh, it is available in ebook form for those in the side of the world. Before I dive into the book and unpack a bit more about, about uh, St. John Paul II, I'd like to forget about you, the author behind the book, um, Patrick. Who is Patrick? Um, are you a cradle Catholic? What's your faith journey been like? T take us from the beginning. Uh, where was your upbringing? Let let's get wow, to know so, you a bit. Yeah, I mean, th this story could be a book in itself. Um, I'm a farm <laughs> kid. I'm a farm kid from Saskatchewan. I'm, I'm, uh, I have German Polish roots. My last name is Polish, but my ancestors on my mother and father's side both spoke German. Um, they, they were from Northern Poland, uh, going back 200 years, uh, emigrated to Canada in 1904 and, uh, farmed the land. My father farmed cattle and grain, uh, cradle Catholics as far back as we can go on both sides of the family. Um, I guess my, my faith journey, um, uh, gosh, how, how do you even describe it? We went to church every Sunday. I, I went through all the sacraments. Uh, I was a typical rebellious teenage boy and uh, never moved away from the church. I always went to church on Sunday, but I didn't embrace the faith until I was in my mid 20s. I, I kind of went through a crisis, actually. I got fired from a job and, uh, I, and I couldn't get back on my feet. So I got down on my knees and, and I said, Lord, I can't do this. I just can't do it on my own. I need you. And I meant it. It was really the first prayer from the heart that I, I, I ever prayed. Um, and it wasn't desperation. It was just surrender. Uh, I, 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 there's something in me knew that, that I couldn't make my life what it should be, that I tried everything and I was failing. And the, the first gift I guess I received from that was, was peace. Uh, I, I wasn't anxious about my career or my work anymore or, or where I was going to find work or what was going to happen. Uh, I started going to daily mass and going to confession more regularly. And then within a few months, and actually this is interesting, this was just uh, 25 years ago today, as a matter of fact, th this month, February, um, I, I moved from Saskatchewan to Southern California. And I started working as I was a journalist uh, and publicist, even back then, I started working for a Catholic magazine called You Magazine. Prior to that, it was called Veritas. And, uh, uh, and this was all part of the journey. After I prayed that surrender prayer, um, God opened this door. 
and I knew what was right. And, and I, I moved into this uh, beautiful faith community in Southern California of, of young on fire Catholics. I had never prayed the divine mercy chaplet. I didn't know about Faustina and the divine wow. mercy message. I had no idea. We prayed the rosary every day. We went to mass together every day. These are young Catholic people between 18 and 28. Um, we prayed the, the chapel of the rosary, mass, confession, just lived the faith in, in, in a vibrant way. And it was transformative. I, and I was only mm -hmm. there for 10 months. And, and from there, I, I got this beautiful opportunity to work at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where they, they publish all the Divine Mercy uh, materials, prayer cards, uh, it's a pilgrimage site. They have a huge mass every Mercy Sunday uh, that's broadcast around the world on EWTN. Uh, so I was the publicist for the shrine, uh, did a lot of their community relations and, and uh, publicity f worldwide. Um, and I was also assistant editor of their magazine. And the, the, this, this whole thing of, I, I met John Paul II five times by, during the time I worked for the Marians. And it all happened when, when I won a contest. I won a trip for two to Cancun. And uh, I called the travel agent and I said, I don't want to go to Cancun. I want to go to Rome. And my boss said, well, if you're going to Rome, you might as well stay at our house there. And by the way, would you like to meet the Pope? <laughs> and yeah, that that's a what I question? did. I just <laughs> kind of chuckled and I said, if there's a list, could you put me on it, please? And, and he did. And this is in, in 1997. So um, how it worked with John Paul II was he had a daily mass in his, his private chapel, held about 30, 35 people in the, in the papal apartments. And if you were on the list and you were a lay person, uh, they would call you the night before if there was a seat available. And so I had been in Rome for uh, just a couple of days and, and they hadn't called, but it was October uh, last day of September of 1997. This is my first meeting with John Paul II. Um, and, and we got the call. So I, I, I got to meet John Paul II for the first time on October 1st, 1997. The interesting thing is that I've been asking for St. Therese's intercession and I got to meet him on her feast day, which was a, a remarkable gift. You, you know, no one can convince me that the saints don't intercede because that was a true miracle. Uh, nice, and the reason I, I, I reached out to St. Therese uh, for her intercession was because when she was 16, she went to Rome, she got to meet the Pope. So I said, put in a good word for me, all right, because you got, you got your audience and, and I would love to have mine. And uh, so that, that, um, that trip to Rome was the beginning of, of a journey for me that year in Europe. So the Marians were also spread out through Eastern Europe. The, and, and John Paul had asked the, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception to lead the re-evangelization of Eastern Europe. They had priests and brothers behind the Iron Curtain. And this is, you know, late 90s, less than 10 years after the fall of the Iron Curtain for Ukraine, where I went first. It was only six years of, of freedom for the Ukrainians. And the Marians had, had great needs. They, they had needs for training seminarians and vocations and their, their buildings were crumbling. So I traveled all through Eastern Europe for, for, for a month and gathered stories of, of their work, came back, wrote about those stories in their magazine, which went out to a quarter of a million people. The stories were extraordinarily uh, well-received and they, they brought in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the Marian said, this kid's got something, let's send him back. So they sent me back in 98 and I met the Pope again, went through Eastern wow. Europe, wrote stories, they were successful. I went back in 99, saw the Pope again, went back in 2000 for Faustina's canonization and, and met the Pope again. And then um, that was, then I met my wife <laughs> and, and then we got married. Uh, I, I left the Marians to go to a different job but I brought her back to Rome in 2002 for a honeymoon. And we knelt in front of a saint and he blessed us 11 days after we got married. So that was my, my fifth and final time meeting him was kneeling at his feet with my bride. And that was sort of the launch point for where I am now because it, it, it was you know my vocation, it was sealed by this, this meeting with a saint. And 
we were talking about my book earlier. My book is really the fruit of all of this because I pondered why does a farm kid from Saskatchewan, Canada get to meet the greatest Pope of the last thousand years five times? Um, and I think it's the book. I think um, all, all of this happened because God wanted me to, or wanted someone, he picked me, to, to tell John Paul's story in a unique way. So what I did was mm -hmm. I, I started telling the story in, in, in talks that I would give across the country, across the United States and Canada, of how I met this great saint. And not only that, but what his legacy is. And, and I counted down his top 10 gifts to the church. And I've been giving this talk for almost 10 years. And then a, a couple of years ago, I realized that his 100th birthday is coming up. It was May of 2000. He turned, yes. would have turned 100, the centenary of his birth. And so I started thinking, this needs to be a book. So I started talking to Catholic publishers and, and they said, uh, the idea just kind of evolved, you know, the idea of, of what this book should be. They said, the, we decided we're going to write 100 ways that he changed the world. And I kept those top 10 that, that I've been talking about for all those years and added 90 more on top of that. It was difficult to whittle it down because he, you know, he, he, he touched everyone. Everyone in the planet was touched by John Paul II throughout his 26 year pontificate. Um, so th the book really just unpacks that legacy in a unique way by giving bite-sized, very condensed, but very um, thorough um, information about what he did and what he said and how he impacted the, the culture and the world and the church. Wow, it certainly did. Huh. I can't wait to read it and get my hands on that. Um, my uh, goodness, there's a lot you just packed in there. I just want to just re-emphasize a few things uh, before we sort of unpack the book itself. But uh, the significance, what stands out to me uh, where you said you were in California and you had those young people that in that really helped you. I guess you were always a practicing Catholic, but that helped take it to another level, if you like. And you is would that be correct? Having these other oh, young on fire Catholics, ab absolutely. You know, it's 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 amazing. The, the and John Paul talked about this so much that the family yes. is kind of the the cradle of 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 the church. It's it's the domestic church because mm. that's where we we receive the sacraments, we receive training from our parents, and and we learn from their example and and um, kind of learn how to how to operate in the world. But once we're out of the house, we need to create or, or find community that will help us to grow in holiness and, and sancti ho ho holiness and virtue. Mm -hmm. and, and I emphasize this in, in another talk as well, that we need to find friends who and, and, and community to surround ourselves with people who will help us grow in holiness and, and virtue. And if, if, we, if our friends aren't doing that, we need to find new friends. And I found those friends in California, that community, uh, and I still keep in touch with many of them. Wow. That's, and I, I, I have to laugh that you, you said you didn't know what the Divine Mercy Chaplet was, and, and you found yourself soon after that <laughs> working for... <laughs> The shrine, the, the national shrine of divine mercy, with the map. It was Providence. Wow, wow! And Look now I that. have divine mercy right, right above. There me it right is, here. our Lord. Now I, I personally am, and just uh, I'm amazed every year. My, my devotion to divine mercy just gets deeper and deeper. I discover something new each year, and it's just phenomenal. And what the Marians are doing, we have to have a shout out here at this point. Uh, I mean, what, what's going on? Um, is Father Donald Calloway a Marian? He seems to be really big now yes. on, on the Saint Joseph. Um, consecration and and the church has officially uh, dedicated this year to Saint Joseph and and the Marians oh, yeah, right no, so in the thick of it. Interesting, interesting thing uh, about that is that I I met him in the fall of 1996 when he was Brother Don, and wow, he wow. told me his story, uh, his conversion story, and and I, it was so dramatic. I said. Brother Don, this needs to be a movie someday, or at least a book. And and I wanted to be the one to tell the story because yes. I love telling stories. Yes. But I mean, he he's gone on to be uh, to to do extraordinary things. Father Michael Gately again doing extraordinary yes. things yes. in the church. Um, brother, father, sorry, I keep calling him brother. Father <laughs> Don 
uh, wrote a letter to Pope Francis a couple of years ago suggesting that we have a year dedicated to St. Joseph. And uh, there have been some news reports that that, that was, I mean, we, uh, we won't really know unless we ask the Pope himself, yes. but that was likely the impetus to, to this year of St. Joseph uh, and the consecration to St. Joseph. And that, that book has been uh, just to set the world on fire, not just yeah. the United States. And, uh, and on top of that, Father Don also endorsed my book, which, which is, is really extraordinary. Another, uh, staying on Father Don, when, when I went to Rome for the first time and met John Paul for the first time, he was with me and uh, oh, wow. he okay. got sick. He got sick that night. Uh, I guess he, 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 he kids that he ate too much gelato in, in <laughs> Rome. <laughs> and uh, he was not able to join our group to go meet the Holy Father that that morning. And uh, but he subsequently he did get his chance to meet John Paul II. But he was supposed to be be with me that day. Oh, interesting. <laughs> well, yeah. shout out to Father Don now and, and get that if you haven't got the consecration book, 33 day to consecration, please do. Um, we've got it. You can go to St. Joseph consecration.org or, or at the Perusia Media website. Fantastic book. And it is life changing. Um, the Marians amazing as well what they're doing and and uh and for you to be a part of that and really be it sounds like have a big part in into their global reach um and and it's it's, it's quite an honor and privilege and and honor to, to to learn this as well today with you it was and, and a matter of fact when when i met john paul the the first time and and actually the fourth time i presented him with pages from marion.org Marion's website. I, I was the webmaster for four years and, and did two, uh, two renovations of the website. And, and that's what I was showing him in, in, in the, uh, and I'll send you the pictures so you can share them with your audience of, of meeting John Paul and sharing with him. And very humbling to stand beside the Vicar of Christ and, and talk to him and have him listen to you and, and I had that opportunity four times and just really extraordinary um, graces that come with that. Oh, well, I'm, I'm excited to dive in. Um, I do have to say thank you to uh, the Divine uh, Mercy Publications in Australia, John Canavan, who introduced me first to the Marians. That's how I learned of them for the first time. They're doing great work promoting the devotion of Divine Mercy. Um, so if people don't know much about Divine Mercy, check it out um, and learn more about it. But I'm excited to learn more about your visits with Pope John Paul. And then we've got to get some of these. We're not going to get all 100 in this show, but uh, maybe we can get a handful of, of a handful of ways of how St. John Paul changed the world. But uh, let's dive in. I mean, I'm curious to know uh, what your conversation was like with the Pope. Uh, many people probably be wondering, did you have much to say? Uh, did he, um, yeah, let, let's, did, do you remember each of those visits and, and was, was much discussed or was it just very very brief, very quick. And um, what was it like? Yeah. So the audiences that I was part of were, um, I got to be a part of the mass with, with him as his private mass. So I'll, I'll just start with the very first one. Yes. Um, it was October 1st, 1997. Um, I, I came to the papal apartments and was met by then Bishop Jeevish, now Cardinal Jeevish, um, Cardinal of Krakow. Um, and he, he, basically greeted us he brought us uh brought, brought me into the um the, the private chapel john paul ii was kneeling uh, sorry he yeah he was kneeling in prayer in front of the tabernacle uh, and when i saw him for the first time uh, I, I came around this corner and boom there he was uh, about four meters from me I mean, he was right in front of me, this man that I had seen and admired for for years. And he was real. I mean, it was just um, it was almost overwhelming. My, my heart literally jumped in my chest. And as, as kind of a, a prelude to this, uh, when I was 16 years old, 1994, John Paul II visited Canada for the first time. He still, to this day, is the only pope to ever visit Canada. He came back in 2002 for World Youth Day. But in 94, he toured the entire country. I think it was like 10, 10 12 days that he was in Canada. And um, it, 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 I, I didn't have a chance to see him, but I was invited to go with a group from my church, church ladies. I didn't go. I was 16. I didn't want to be with a group of ladies. I don't remember why I didn't go. But during that time frame, 
uh, I had this dream that he came to our house and that I, I gave him a hug. He hugged me. I, I mean, I literally hugged the Pope in this dream and I woke up and it was so vivid and so real. To this day, I know what that felt like. And when I saw him for real, I wanted to give him a hug because I, I, I felt like I already had. And the cool thing about this dream is that when I, I, I've given this talk to dozens and dozens of groups and about every 10th group or so, it, somebody will put up their hand and say, I had a dream just like that. And so wow. I think, you know, John Paul II was a mystic. There's no question about that. I really believe that, that part of his, his charisma, part of his, 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 his gift was that he touched people that he never met. Padre Pio, same thing. I mean, there are people that saw Padre Pio hundreds of miles away, thousands of miles away, but he never left his monastery. Um, just that, I, I don't know if it's by location or, or just uh, a, a mystical experience, but uh, I believe it's real. I mean, I, I didn't until I start hearing other stories of people who had other dreams of John Paul that were so vivid and so real that they wake up and realize it's a dream they'll never forget. So going back to my, my first audience uh, and, and to your question, um, so this mass, I'm, I'm in like the fifth row, uh, about 30, 35 people in, in the chapel. And I stared at him the entire time. I didn't want to miss a single detail. I was uh, absorbing it all. And uh, um, he didn't give a homily. He celebrated the mass. He didn't distribute communion. He just sat and the mass went by relatively quickly, 25 minutes. And then they led us into an adjoining room. Now, there are about 35 people, some, most of them priests, some of them were Polish seminarians, um, and we lined up in kind of a horseshoe pattern, and the Pope came out, and, and I was nervous. I, I had this presentation that had everything worked out, what I was going to say, um, but when he entered the room, all of that anxiety just fled. I mean, it was like uh, so peaceful. Uh, he just carried this aura of peace uh, about him, and uh, it was like standing next to my father. So... Uh, and, and the other thing is that I was about, I was the only one in that group who had a gift for him. So everyone else basically was introduced. He, 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 they kissed his ring. Um, he, he, he gave them a rosary and he moved to the next person. Um, and, and so when it came for me, uh, I, I held my folder with these pages from Marion.org. I explained to him what I was showing him. He said, thank you. Uh, he pressed a rosary in my hand and he moved to the next person. So he was very wise. He knew that if he engaged in conversation, he would be there for an hour and that his, his time was very limited. So uh, that's kind of how it went. Uh, the next time I met him was about a year later. And it was his 50th anniversary of his, uh, his being consecrated a bishop. So okay. wow. uh, 1958, 1958, and it was 1998. Okay. It was a 40, 40th anniversary of being consecrated a bishop. And so I, I had some altar linens for him that were created by the Felician nuns on the property where I worked. I presented that to him. The next year was 99. I saw him in Poland, didn't have an audience, um, but I, I was in a group of people uh, with the Marian fathers. As a matter of fact, he dedicated the Marian shrine in central Poland that day. And I actually oh, got wow. to stay on the same property overnight, uh, about 100 meters away from, from where the Holy Father was. Uh, and, and that was a really remarkable experience as well. And then I came back to Rome in 2000 for Faustina's canonization and had another audience with him with a new updated Marian.org, presented those to him, and, and then uh, came back two years later with my bride and, and had the audience in the square. Praise God. Wow. So you, yeah. yeah you what an honor. Um, now in your research, in your, now this book, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious to, uh, to learn what are some, some things that you'd like to share? Um, just, just a few, just to whet our appetite a bit. Uh, how did this great man change the world? Um, please, wow. please um, give us a few that, that you could, could mention. Yeah. You know, the, the, I, I, so what I did was I took his top 10, and, and I kept those in, in order of what I thought were the most important. The, the other 90 from 100 down to 11 
are, are sort of grouped in, in categories, if you will, um, mm -hmm. how he affected nations, how he affected different groups of people like police officers, firemen. Um, he had specific addresses to groups of police, of firemen, of, of other uh, nurses, doctors. So I break those out because you know, his, his reach was really extraordinary. Uh, different areas of, of politics, of philosophy, of history. Um, he canonized hundreds of saints and, and, and blesseds. Um, but the interesting thing is that he had relationships with saints as well. Mother Teresa, uh, his relationship, Mother Teresa, the only woman to ever ride in a Pope mobile. Oh, okay. And she was not invited. She invited herself. No one said no to Mother Teresa, not even the Pope. So she climbs up in the Pope mobile. He's like, that's Mother Teresa. Come on in. <laughs> um, he had a relationship with Padre Pio when he was studying in Rome um, before he was was uh, before he was a bishop. Uh, he he took a week off and he went to uh, visit Padre Pio. And most people don't know this. But he, he spent some time with Padre Pio. Um, there, the details of that, that time with him are very limited. Um, but the, the visit did occur. Now, there are some rumors that Pio said to him, Carol Wojtyla, you will one day be the Pope. John Paul said, no, that didn't happen. Didn't happen. Okay. But I'm sure that there was some conversation that wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall? Um, Absolutely. Th this is one thing that I was able to confirm. John Paul knew that Padre Pio was a mystic. He knew that he had great healing power, that, that his intercessor, intercessory prayer was, was, could move mountains. John Paul had a friend who was a doctor in Poland who was, who was going in for a surgery. I think she had cancer. And he sent a note to Padre Pio that said, please pray for my friend. She's got cancer. Um, you know, she's a doctor. Uh, and Padre Pio wrote him back and said, I can't refuse you. So he prayed for this woman. Now she went in for her surgery and, and the doctors took a look and went, she's cured. She doesn't, doesn't need surgery. And they sent her home. <laughs> so that was Pio's intercession. For John Paul II, Carol Wojtyla. Uh, now, Padre Pio died in 1968. So this is, you know, mm -hmm. while he's still Archbishop of Krakow, it uh, seems to me it was the early 60s. Um, sticking with saints, um, John Paul II was fluent in many languages. Uh, some say as many as 18 languages. He, he gave Maybe. his Urbi at Orbi uh, message in, I think, 70 languages uh, the year and a half before he died. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he was extraordinarily fluent. Uh, when he was learning English, uh, he didn't really get very good at English until around the time he was elected Pope. But when he was learning English, he studied Fulton Sheen. He studied how he, he studied his inflection, his delivery, his cadence. And then when John Paul came to the United States in 1979 for the first time as Pope, he came to New York City. It was September 1979. And um, he, he went to St. Patrick's Cathedral. And you have to remember, this is a new pope. He's, he's brand new. People really don't know him. They don't know his gifts or what he will do. Um, but the pope comes to New York only the second time in history. Paul VI had come to New York in 65. So the pope's in New York and he comes to the cathedral and Fulton Sheen, one of the most famous Catholics of the 20th century, um, you know, from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, he was literally the face of Catholicism in the United States, uh, far more than any of our cardinals and bishops are today. I mean, he was, he had a TV show that was a top rated TV show when there was no internet. So you got to think, yeah, that's right. This is what people want. They went to the movies and they watched TV, they listened to the radio. That's all there was. For getting information, right? So okay. Fulton Sheen, superstar. Fulton Sheen didn't even come out because he didn't want to upstage the Pope. He just kind of stayed out of the way. But John Paul says, where is Fulton Sheen? I want to meet Fulton Sheen. So Sheen comes out, and, and, and I don't think that this was even in public, but um, they meet, John Paul throws his arms around 
Bishop Sheen. And he says, you are a true son of the church. You have spoken well of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Sheen couldn't say a word. He was sobbing. He was just wow. weeping. And it was an incredible moment. Incredible moment. I, I, so, I'm about to so, sob because I, I, I've seen the photo. Um, yeah. Of that, yeah. and and you could see the emotion in in, in Fulton, Venerable Fulton Sheen. Uh, yeah. Did he not say something about uh, Pope John Paul II's pontificate and and how he wished uh, he could ex he could witness what was about to take place or something like that? He was he had high hopes of this. Yes, yes. So that wasn't part of the conversation. That was a letter. So Fulton okay. Sheen writes wow. the Pope a letter uh, about a month later, uh, <laughs> October or so of 1979. John Paul writes a letter back. Now, these letters are, they're, they're public. They just have to Google them. They are heartfelt. They are deep. They are beautifully written. They're mm. extraordinary. Um, so John Paul writes back in about November. And a month later, December of 79, Fulton Sheen dies. But what a beautiful end to an extraordinary life, right? Absolutely. I mean, you're embraced by uh, uh, two great saints embracing and and praising each other for their 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 commitment to the church and and their witness to the truth and uh it's 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 just beautiful Absolutely. um and so there, there are stories like this in the book stories about um uh, maximilian colby um uh, john yeah. paul really went to bat for colby when when they said that uh, they were debating, theologians were debating whether Maximilian Kolbe surrendering his life to save the life of another was truly martyrdom. And, and there was this debate, was it, wasn't it? I mean, was he killed for his faith? He surrendered his life, yes. But was he killed for his faith or did he just surrender his life? John Paul basically put an end to the argument and said, I'm declaring him a martyr. I am the Pope. I'm doing this. That's it. <laughs> and uh john john paul had a great devotion to fulton sheen i i don't think that they, they they never met in person the same thing with faustina um john paul uh moved to krakow when he was 18 years old and and just uh, uh i think wow. august september of 1938 and later that year faustina died so he moved to krakow just basically there were ships in the night but he went to the convent where she was, where, where she, she lived and died. Um, he went there frequently to pray. So he knew it well. He knew her message well. Mm. And he shepherded her cause and the, the authentication of her diary. And we have divine mercy thanks to the, the work of John Paul II and his belief in, in the authentic message that Jesus gave her. So he played a great role in that. So just some tidbits on, on aspects of the book. Um, you know, he, John oh Paul, uh, moving over to nations, uh, he had a great love for the United States. He came here, uh, I think this is uh, France, uh, Poland, uh, were two countries he visited more than the United States, but I think he had six visits to the United States. And he understood the great calling that the United States had to uphold truth and the dignity mm. of the human person and peace in the world. And he called the United States to account. And he said, you've been given this responsibility by God. You have a divine calling as a nation to, to make this world what it should be uh, and to, to be a Christian people. And, um, and, and it was powerful. He really admired the founding documents of the United States and, and um, quoted them rather frequently. Uh, wow. I think he knew the United States better than than most Americans do, uh, and, and we need to revisit his his writings and his uh, his calling to the United States to really live up to its potential. Um, yeah. He went to he he didn't go to China, he didn't go to Russia, but he had outreach to China. Uh, matter of fact, he broadcast messages into China when he got to some of the bordering countries, uh, Korea, uh, Korea and Japan. Uh, he would broadcast messages into China. He had diplomatic outreach to China. Um, same thing with Russia. His great desire of his heart was to, to go to Russia. And, and it looks like that perhaps in the next year, year and a half, Pope Francis may go to Russia. And all of this yeah. is thanks to the groundwork laid by John Paul II. So really a lot of the things that he did, that he moved toward, are coming to fruition now. Um, 
Uh, I could talk about the top 10 uh, if you want to move into that or if you've got more questions. Yeah, well, well I do. I, we've got about um, seven minutes here. Uh, and I know okay. I we've got to get you on for part two, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would love that. But, yeah, we may. But I, I want to hone in on uh, you, you talked about, um, you know, the, the Iron Wall, Iron Curtain going, coming down. Right. His, his um, and this nation, I mean, Poland, uh, it was under communist regime. Uh, for so long uh, and and he experienced sort of uh two different uh, did he not have um yeah. uh two different uh types of persecution if you like uh growing up uh in in, in world wars and then and then later on t- the transition to what would have been a more peaceful transition but but really discovered that the commun- communist uh, regime was not um was not a better uh, option on the surface it might have looked all peaceful and, and fair for everyone, but really there was an agenda behind it. We we don't really know, but let's talk about that. Um, his visit to Poland uh, very soon after becoming Pope, um, and it was frowned yeah. upon at the time. Tell us about, I guess, what was going on around in that time. Well, let me set the background a little bit. Yes, please. Um, and so he, I, I mentioned he moved to Krakow when he was 18. He went to university, he was studying. Um, his father died. He decided he was going to be a priest. Uh, right around this time, the Nazis um, invaded Poland. So he lived, uh, he went to a clandestine seminary um, during the Nazi occupation. Um, and, and then as the war unfolded, the, the Soviet Union took over Poland and he lived under communism. Um, so he, he, this is another reason he had such uh, a synergy with Fulton Sheen because Sheen understood communism and, mm-hmm. and railed against communism and, and uh, John Paul greatly admired that. Um, so th- then John Paul's elected Pope. He, he was, he's the first uh, Slavic Pope, the first Pope from uh, non-Italian Pope in 400 years uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit, I really believe, inspired the cardinals of the church, the College of Cardinals, to choose this man because um, he, it, was, it was predestined, essentially. They said that when he became pope, he already knew how to be pope because uh, of, of his, his grasp of the church, the languages. He was a father of the Vatican, Second Vatican Council. Um, the greatest desire of his heart was that he, he could return to his homeland. Uh, so it was supposed to be in May, uh, May, I think May of 1979, uh, just like less than a year after he became Pope. Um, it's occupied by the, 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 the Soviet Union. It's a communist government in Poland. Um, he, he came as a, essentially as a conquering hero because the people loved him. They knew him well. They were so proud to have a Polish Pope. Um, uh, the, the Soviets, uh, the, the communists at the time, did their very best to minimize his message. And he didn't actually talk about government at all. He talked about freedom. He talked about liberty. He talked about faith. And the people chanted, we want God. We want God. And it was, it was like a shockwave went through Poland that they, they simply couldn't contain his message as much as they tried. They showed it on TV, but they only showed tight shots of old ladies and, and they showed little snippets of, of people, but they didn't show the big picture of what he was doing. Millions and millions of Poles came out in person to see him. The rest, like 99% of the country watched him on TV if they couldn't be there in person. And he called down the Holy Spirit on the country and, and in a very powerful, powerful and authoritative way. You know, in the scriptures, when they say that Jesus, it was in the gospel just last Sunday, Jesus spoke with authority and they were like, they were like, they couldn't believe it. They could feel it when he spoke. John Paul spoke with authority when he came to Poland. He didn't talk against the government. He talked for the people and, and the, the rights that they have as, as children of God and that had been deprived, they've been deprived of for decades. And he just, the, the, this pride in, in, in being a Pole, in being Catholic, welled up in the hearts of Poles. And it, it, it's, like I said, it's in shockwaves through the, the whole um, Soviet Union, but it really was the first crack in, this, in, in the Iron Curtain. It, it, it's, there's a, a documentary about this called Nine, Way, Nine Days That, oh, shoot, Nine, <laughs> Nine Days That Changed the World. 
That's what it's called. Uh, done by Newt Gingrich, who is a former Speaker of the House in the United States. Completely transformative. And, and so that was the very first step in his program, essentially, to end Soviet-style communism in Western Europe. And certainly one of the most consequential um, things that he did, coupled with his friend Ronald Reagan, which I, I could talk about Reagan and John Paul for a whole hour. There's wow. just so much there. The, 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 the brothers, the, they felt like brothers. Uh, Reagan called John Paul II his best friend. Wow. wow. There was an incident. Uh, if, if we, I'll, I'll give you just 30 seconds. Please. 19, nine, 1989. Poland had just been given a birth of freedom. The, the Iron Curtain has crumbled. Uh, delegates from Poland came to the United States. This is a year after Reagan is out of office. He's not, no longer president. They came to visit him in California, and they saw a picture of John Paul II on his mantle. And they were shocked by this. I guess they, they weren't studying history or they just weren't expecting it. And, and Reagan, without even them asking a question, he pointed to the picture and he said, he's my best friend. I know I'm Protestant, he's Catholic, <laughs> but he's still my best friend. He always Look referred to John Paul II as his best friend. Wow. Look at that. So, yeah, we're going to have to know more about that in another, another episode. This is phenomenal. We are, I can't believe it. There's so much more. I'm, I'm just... Uh, yeah, f filled with joy just hearing all this. Uh, um, I, I I just want more. So I guess we have to get the book to know more and, and get you one again, just to, to do it maybe in time for an, uh, one of the um, maybe for in October or, or we have another feast. I'm thinking of May as well is the anniversary. Um, was it his funeral? Did it, was it in May? I'm, I'm trying he, to remember he, now. He April. was he 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 died on the vigil of Divine Mercy in yes. 2005. His, his, uh, so that's April 2nd, I believe, was his Maybe. death in 2005. His birthday is May 18th. His feast day is October 22nd. So um, lots, lots it, of options. <laughs> you call, I'm available. Uh, well, how do people get in touch with your book? How, how do we get a copy of it uh, at the moment? Where is it available? Okay, it's available on Amazon. Uh, if people want to go to my website, uh, booksbypatrick.com, you can buy a, um, um, uh, an autographed copy there. And I'll ship it to Australia. It's uh, 20 US dollars to ship. So uh, if people are willing to invest the amount to, it takes to get it there, um, yes. I'll ship it to Australia. I'll sign it to whoever you want. Uh, and I'll even give you a discount for multiple copies. So uh, that's where they can find it, booksbypatrick.com. My, my work as a Catholic publicist is also, uh, you can go to catholicpublicist.com to see uh, the work that I'm doing there. Brilliant. We'll put all the, the links below for you. So please take advantage and get to know more about Patrick's work. I, I want to thank you, Patrick, uh, for your time. I, I feel it's just gone so quick. Um, <laughs> like I said, we've got to get you back on. But uh, thank you for everything you do. And I'm looking forward to getting a copy of the book myself and, and really want to promote that across the region here. So thank you again. And uh, please keep us in the prayers as you are in ours. Absolutely. Thank you. That's Patrick Novikoski. Uh, and so please visit the websites and get to know more about what he's doing. Thank you again. We are out of time again. Um, thanks for joining us. To get all of the uh, Perusia podcasts, you can go to our website, perusiamedia.com and get it, be in touch with all the, all the shows there. Thanks again and God bless. <laughs>